All right, everyone, it's 6 o'clock. I'm going to call this meeting to order, and I'll uh, start by asking us all to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilmember Hilton. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and then remain standing for our invocation. Good evening, everybody. I um, always want to say thank you to the council for the privilege of being able to address you uh, during council meetings and pray for the meetings and pray for our city as well that we all love and we all care for. A wise old man told me when I first became a pastor, I won't tell you how long ago, um, he said, listen to the bleeding of the sheep. And little did I know how valuable that advice would be. And I think it's a great form of advice, not just for shepherds of churches, but for shepherds of communities. And your task has been to govern and watch over the community's needs and meet those needs in the best way that you possibly can. Sometimes the bleeding of the sheep will help you identify those needs so that you can be wise in the decisions you make to meet those needs. I encourage you to listen to the bleeding of the sheep there's a, a wise old proverb out of the Jewish scriptures that says, a wise man or woman, a wise man scales the walls of the cities and they look out. And that's the task that you're called to look and see. Where is the city? What are we doing? How can we make the decisions that are needed to be made in the best interest of our community, the constituents and the, the leadership working together on that? So thank you for being in seeking wisdom and counsel and all that you do. And uh, we appreciate from our standpoint that you are trying to govern as best possible in the best possible way, our community. So with that, may I offer a word of prayer before we begin. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve, whether it be in the church, whether it be in the community, in one way or the other, um, uh, ask for wisdom. There are so many issues, so many possibilities, and so many possibilities for bottlenecks. I pray that you will give wisdom to this council and to the citizens of our community as we work together to bring greatness and goodness to our city. Lord, I'm also reminded as we um, approach National Police Week that you will always be with our first responders. And this May, when we... Um, Remember that time for officers and what they have endured and what they have, some have died for during National Police Memorial Week. I pray that you will always keep our officers safe, bring them home safely from each of their watch, and all of our first responders, fire and uh, EMTs, the, the, all of our first responders, God. We trust them into your hands, and we pray a hedge of protection around them and our community. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, welcome to all the members of the public who are here. I'd like to remind you all, if anybody is planning to speak on any item on or off the agenda, to please fill out a speaker card and hand it to our city clerk so that we can plan appropriately for all those who wish to 
to speak. And also, as your item comes up, to please come and sit in this front row where we're reserving seat, uh, seats for people who want to speak on agenda items. All right, um, item three, city clerk's report on posting the agenda. Yes, Madam Mayor, the uh, agenda was posted on April 28th, 2022 at 2.30 p.m. Thank roll you, call. and roll call. Councilmember Armadares? Here. Councilmember Baca? Here. Councilmember Hilton? Here. Councilmember Libra Munoz? Present. Councilmember Marks? Here. Councilmember Tovar? Here. And Mayor Blankley? Here. All right, item 1.3, uh, sorry, 1.2, orders of the day, uh, we have nothing there. 1.3, employee introductions, we have nothing there. Item 2. 2.1 is proclamations, awards, and presentations. We have two items there. I'm going to start with a proclamation for Bike Awareness Month. And I'm going to read, whereas the city of Gilroy joins cities and counties throughout the country in promoting May as National Bike Month and the 20th of May 2022 as Gilroy Bike to Wherever Day. And whereas Gilroy acknowledges that walking and bicycling are transportation modes that promote healthy living, alleviates traffic and parking congestion, reduces air pollution and decreases fuel consumption. And whereas both National Bike Month and Bike Tour Every Day are effective in converting drivers into bicyclists and educating citizens about the environmental importance of walking and biking to school or work regularly. And whereas Gilroy's efforts to promote Bike Tour Every Day 2022 include an energizer station at the Christmas Hill Park staffed by the Parks and Recreation Commission and volunteers, and I know our chair, oh, there she is, is here. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, Mayor of the City of Gilroy, on this second day of May 2022, along with my colleagues on the City Council, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Bike Awareness Month. I'm going to come and bring it to you right now. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you. Um, just a short, let me see if I can squeeze in here. So I'm Teresa Graham and I'm the chairperson for the Parks and Recreation Commission and um, also uh, overseeing the recently dissolved Bikes and Peds Commission. Um, May is Bicycle Awareness Month encouraging more Gilroy citizens to try biking and also educating them on the benefits of bicycling in our community. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission is pleased to accept the Council Proclamation of Bicycle Awareness Month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. All right, and the next one is for National Public Works Week. Speaking of first responders, we have Public Works first responders too. And whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of California, and whereas these infrastructures, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are federally mandated first responders and the engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Gilroy to gain knowledge and maintain ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works first responders, and public works programs in our community, and whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, Mayor of the City of Gilroy, California, do hereby designate the week of May 15th to 21st, 2022, as National Public Works Week. We go. Should have said together with the council. It didn't say that in English. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mayor and council, we I want to just thank you on behalf of the dozens of uh, public works employees that we have working hard every morning, every day, keeping this. Uh, 
um, community safe and clean. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. Okay, fun stuff is over. Item three, <laughs> uh, public comment. This is the time for uh, any public comment for items not on the agenda. So, yeah, how many? Madam Mayor, I received eight written public, uh, eight written public comments that was provided to you through email. And I have the two speaker cards. The first one is Ron Kirkish, followed by Marty Cheek. So two speaker cards on this item. An item's not on the agenda? Correct. Okay. Three-minute time limit. Great. Good evening, Mayor, Good City evening. Council, and community. Earlier today, I sent out a K&N, and it, it refers to a decision made earlier today that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the city of Boston was not had basically violated the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment, because they denied uh, a Christian group from flying their flag at the on their city hall uh, flagpole after they had already uh, approved flying the LGBT flag and any other flag. That was against the Constitution and against the law. I've been requested by people in our community. By the way, uh, the original decision here was based on, I believe, very narrow political personal issues instead of broad issues for the whole community. The thing that uh, also I would requested uh, by members of the uh, community to ask you to consider flying the Christian flag and the thin blue flag. I would appreciate it if you would seriously consider those uh, requests. Um, the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court was unanimous. There was not a single vote uh, supporting the Boston uh, decision not to allow the Christian flag to be flown. I think we're going to need to make some changes to our flag policy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. If I may interrupt for just a second, I'll actually be addressing that case in the city attorney's report, which will not come for a while. Well, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members. I'm Marty Cheek. I'm the publisher of Morgan Hill Life and Gilray Life newspapers. And I'm sure some of you, have, or all of you have read about a project called Vision 2020 that I've been working on for too many years. And uh, tonight, I want to ask you all a favor. Um, the background of this, this Vision 2020, when I was a young lad of about 10, my mom took me to Berlin, her hometown, and we discussed the war and the bombing that she experienced. And, she talked about her grandparents hiding Jews with another Lutheran family in a basement in Berlin. And I made a promise to her. I promised that if I ever could find a way to end wars, to find a freedom from wars, um, I would. So I've thought about this for 45 years. And uh, I realized that we have technology now from Silicon Valley and throughout the America to enable us to achieve this, you know, the digital world that we now live in. Um, I want to, I've been working on uh, some videos I'm going to be sending to the city clerk tomorrow, uh, to the council members, and to every elected official in Santa Clara County, and also uh, people who want to be elected officials, people on, on their campaigns. And I'm asking them to fill out a survey. And it's a Vision 2020 uh, Global Peace Survey. And there's 20 goals that we need to achieve to, to reach the, you know, the ultimate goal of uh, a world forever free of wars by Christmas Day in the year 2040. So I am um, just going to be sending this out. Believe me, I am scared to death about this, but I look at what the world's turning into right now and what's happening in Ukraine, the genocide that's happening there. We're the 21st century, and we can't, you know, we have technology to prevent this. So uh, I need your support, if you can. Uh, and if you decline to, please let me know that. Every member, uh, every elected official gets their own web page on our website to say, yes, I support it, or no, I don't, don't support it. And they can make us some comments about this. This is the first step. The next step is go to the media and share with them, you know, who's supporting Vision 2020 and who's not. And ultimately, the goal is to get every elected official in the United States to support this goal. Because Americans need, right now, more than ever, to be united again around an ambitious goal. So um, you'll find in the email, I'm sure, tomorrow, hopefully, uh, this, the links to the survey and a short video explaining 
what I want to achieve. So thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll be able to say it started right here. <laughs> thanks, Mark. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any others? No. no other public comments, Madam Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to item four, reports of council members. Council Member Bracco. Yeah. Um, I wanted to report that an employee of uh, the Gilway Library, Sharon, Sharon Kelly, she was awarded the Outstanding Employee Award last month from the County of Santa Clara. For those that don't know, the library district, all their employees work through the county. We use the county for human resources, payroll, and all that. But they are uh, our employees, and uh, she was recognized for that. And uh, one of the things in our meetings, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, he likes to give us quotes and uh, new information. And one of the things he uh, brought up was if we knew that Santa Clara County is the most diverse county in the United States. The county of Santa Clara has more languages spoken in people's homes than anywhere else in the United States. So, thank you. All right. Thank you. Council Member Armendaris. No report. Council Member Marks. No report. Council Member Hilton. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, from Visit Gilray, marketing results from the Visit Gilray Wedding Expo were shared with the Board of Directors. Highlight includes 43 vendors participated in two, and 200 attended the event. This is the first wedding expo since the fall of 2019, and the interest of Gilray as a wedding destination was significant based on the outcome of the vendor and attendee surveys. March 2022, <coughs> Smith Travel Report indicated for lodging properties in Gilray a 10% increase in occupancy over prior years. $22 increase in average daily rate, and the most important statistics for hotels was a $21 increase over the prior year in revenue per available room. TOT collected during the month of March increased by 36% over the year prior, which is a trend we are seeing for 2022. For Silicon Valley Clean Energy, um, first I want to mention that there was a day earlier in April um, where 97% of the electric grid was for California was from renewables. Storage has been critical to reliability during the transition to renewable energy and it charges and as it charges using solar and wind output during the middle of the day and re-injects it back into onto the grid on hot summer evenings with solar production has ended in demands high. Um, I was able to attend the five-year anniversary for Silicon Valley Clean Energy where they were recognized by their founders, current and former electeds that sit on the board. SVZ began in 2017 and now provides carbon-free electricity to more, to more than 270,000 residential and commercial customers. Using clean power has helped, community, has helped local communities reduce energy-related greenhouse gas emissions by 35% compared to a 2015 baseline and avoid a total of 575 million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions from being released into the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. No report. Council Member LaRoman Yost. No report, but the only thing I the only thing I would say is that I want to thank the staff for putting together the meeting last week with the Gilroy Unified School District. It's always nice to talk to our contemporaries and hear their perspective on school issues. Yes, thank you. Okay, and for mine, it's primarily high speed rail. I'm sure you've all heard on April twenty seventh. The uh, High Speed Rail Authority approved the EIR for Alternative 4. So that means uh, the Merced to San Jose stretch is not going along 101, but instead going to come into Gilroy from the south. And I say that our Gilroy Transit Center, uh, second to San Jose, will be the most uh, significant hub, transit hub, on that stretch, second only to Deardon. So that's pretty exciting. Of course, the timing of it is the giant unknown. They're saying uh, people will be riding it by 2031. I don't mean to laugh, but it's just that it's been seven years and has barely gotten out of Fresno. So uh, we're hoping, but that's, that is what they're saying. And also saying, um, I've been promised that those of us in Gilroy anyway, when we go by the transit center, within two to three years, we should actually see somebody out there working on something. As little as it might be, we would actually see something. So I'm kind of counting on that, but I do think our transit center is ready, and uh, I, I hope this comes when they, when they say it will. 
Um, also, last thing is uh, with Public Works, the, the um, proclamation that I just read, and of course, I mean, we really don't give enough attention to uh, what Public Works does with water, when we think about it, water and sewer and our streets and storm drains and all that stuff. And so the same applies mm. to SCRAW, our water sewer treatment plant. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that this Saturday, uh, the Coffee with the Mayor is going to be with our programs manager out at SCRAW so that everybody can hear about the stuff that we normally don't hear so much about, but is super, super, super important. Okay, moving on to future council initiated agenda items. I have two, Mayor. Two, okay. Um, the first one is I'd like to propose that we ask staff to make a minor language changes to our complete streets policy. Since the bike ped infrastructure duties are transferred from the Bicycle Pedestrian Commission to the Planning Commission, um, there's just some update on the language in the complete streets policy, and I'm happy, happy to answer any clarifying questions. Okay, and then you have a second one? Do you oh, want to do oh. that one first? No, I guess, yeah, right, does anyone else, first of all, is anyone else going to have, is, will anyone else have a future agenda request? I have one. Okay, and you have one too. Mm -hmm. All right, well then, we'll, we'll, yes, we'll take these. Can I ask these. first, did we say this? Yeah, we'll do this one at a time, and so we'll go back to what you just said. So, go ahead. Okay, um, so we have a complete streets policy that, um, that allows us to receive funding for, like, uh, SB funds and M funds from M MTC. Um, since the bike and ped uh, infrastructure duties were listed to be done by the Bicycle Pedestrian Commission. It's just a language cleanup to remove Bicycle Pedestrian Commission and add in uh, the Planning Commission. Okay, is staff maybe already on that, if that's true? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. That is typically one of those things that uh, okay. it uh, doesn't happen immediately. Um, we usually uh, are quick to update those kinds of documents, so I don't think this is a really a big haul for us we can we can do that and, and I believe we'd bring it back to council for a quick review and approval but I don't see this as being a no heavy, I'm wondering if it needs to be a future agenda item or if you could just do it I mean if it's just substituting the <clears throat> the, the commission that it now applies to um, I, I can look at that I, I'm not too sure what it requires to make any modifications to the complete streets program and if it's a, I'll do it as simple as possible and uh, Report back to council. Yeah. Okay. If I may, yeah. it, it would appear to be just a cleanup item, really, caused by the kind of minor change that was made. I would think staff could bring it back, it maybe bring it back to council as an information item, even then. And, but if the policy was adopted by council, and probably the amendment probably has to be adopted too, even though it's a very minor one. It doesn't matter that planning is a chartered commission. So we, if we're changing the scope of its work even a little bit, does it have to be council approved? I think council has approved the change of the planning commission scope by virtue of merging the other commissions with them. So I think that has already occurred. Okay. It's really, I, th I think what Councilmember Hilton is proposing is really just some wording change rather than a subsequent <laughs> change. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I was bringing it to their attention. Right. I mean, it, just because yeah. it, just because you think it would happen doesn't mean that we assume okay. it. And this is a policy decision. The complete streets policy was approved by this body. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, whether it's something as simple as staff uh, redoing the language and putting in our consent calendar, I think that would be good enough. Okay, I, everybody just thumbs up if you, yeah. Okay, so Jimmy, there you go. Okay, item two. Um, I'd like to propose that we adopt a resolution declaring the month of May as Affordable Housing Month. Um, it was celebrated across our region by government and nonprofit organizations. I believe that doing so will highlight one of our council goals to show the region that we are committed to promoting the availability of safe and affordable housing for all residents. Um, this resolution will reaffirm our commitment to the community plan and homelessness as well. Uh, thank you to the members of the public who have supported this, and I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions. Okay, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. I, just a question, because I was doing some research. On March 22nd, we did a resolution on Fair Housing Month, so I'm trying to understand the difference and how uh, the requested um, proclamation is beneficial to Gilroy, because it sounds like uh, I'm, I'm not sure where Gilroy fits in that, and um, I thought that the resolution that we did back in March was what, what you know, what was sufficient to us being asked. Um, fair housing and affordable housing are, are two very different things. I mean, I don't want to get in the discussion of it, but okay. there are two separate things. And, and if you go outside and you look now, the whole entire region is celebrating affordable housing month from Silicon Valley at home, housing action coalition, community plan and homelessness destination home. They're all 
they're doing something every single day of this month. So, okay, I I want to thank you, Councilmember Hilton, for asking asking me first and going through the process for getting this proclamation. Um, I because we had just proclaimed April 2022 as Fair Housing Month, which as Fair Housing Month, right? Uh, which encompasses all that we stand for as an inclusive community for housing opportunities and not only limited to income levels. I felt this request needed to be a council majority request if that's what this council wants to do. As long as Gilroy is at the bottom of our county's income chain and affordable housing is defined by countywide AMI, a proclamation based solely on affordable does more to support adding housing in Gilroy for those who don't currently live here than it does to benefit existing residents who struggle to compete with the income levels of the rest of the county. Proclamations are meant to proclaim sentiments, and we did so beautifully, I thought, with our fair housing proclamation that was inclusive of all of the sentiment that we stand for, where we pledged our commitment to improve housing options and celebrate the value of harmonious and diverse communities by promoting fair housing law. So we're discussing the merits of uh, this now? Uh, no, I'm responding to his request for this. Councilmember Leroy Munoz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, you know, I, I as, as, when I hear this, I, I had kind of a similar thought as uh, Councilmember Tovar did with regard to the fair housing uh, resolution that we did declaring April uh, fair housing uh, month. You know, and if I recall correctly, it, the fair housing resolution dealt with, I think, both options and practices. And I, I think that does encompass the affordability component. I don't think you can have fair housing that doesn't take affordability into account. And so for me, you know, I, I think that if, if there are others who want to, um, you know, go out and support the, the other events kind of going around the county in support of this, I think that's great. But I think our last uh, resolution kind of already did this and already encompassed that. So I, I think it's kind of already been addressed. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Bracco, Council oh, Member oh, okay. Armanderas, and then Council Member Marks. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand why we really do this stuff anyway. Um, a piece of paper is not going to add one unit to the stock of houses. Um, and I, it, uh, what I find interesting, the same groups and, and folks behind having resolutions saying we're, we're doing something are the same folks that are pushing solar panels on all the houses, you know, bicycle lockers, charging stations, electric uh, appliances only in houses, which all just adds to the price of the house and puts it out of reach for most folks. So I, I just, I, I don't care either way, but I, I think it's pretty useless because it doesn't mean anything. Thank you. Well, after everyone has their chance to speak, we're going to have to do a thumbs up or thumbs down. So you'll have to do one or the other. Okay, uh, Council Member Armanderas. So just a point of order. This sounds like everything so far has sounded like we're discussing the merits of this versus just putting it on the agenda or not. And we were told by Andy lots of times that's not what this this is part of the agenda is about. So uh, Council Member <laughs> Armanderas is correct. We are. I, I, I interpret the discussion as being whether or not it should go on the agenda. It's hard to separate a little merits discussion from that, but. She's correct that, of course, our discussion is about whether to put it on the agenda. So do and I the, not the call on the others? Yeah. Shall I not call on the others? I no, I think you should. I should okay, you Council Member Marks. Yeah. All right, well, to me, action speaks a lot, you know, louder than words. And even though this proclamation is good and we all agree with affordable housing, on the other hand, from today to the end of April, is there any more new affordable housing? It's just words. I would love to see next year for this council to do this proclamation and celebrate all of the new affordable housing that allowed Gilroy citizens to actually get into homes. Because when yeah. June 1st comes, how many Gilroy families will be able to come and say, yes, this proclamation actually got us in, into it? I think sometimes we get carried away with proclamations trying to make ourselves feel better and are they really doing anything for the citizens? Okay, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. And I mean, I'm going to go off of the comments made by Councilwoman Marks about actions speak louder than words. And I, I, again, when it comes to affordable housing and fair housing, I think we all, most of us, if not all of us, are in agreement that 
it's needed, obviously. And <clears throat> if, if bringing this proclamation or this discussion to a council meeting, I'm in favor of that for us to have those discussions as Councilwoman Marks has mentioned, you know, what's our, what's our plan? You know, if this is something that's gonna lead us to a plan, then I'm all for it. Um, okay. I was just trying to understand, I, I, I do know the difference between fair and affordable. I was just trying to understand the merits of um, what it was gonna actually do for the citizens right. of Gilroy, but. This okay. is a request for a proclamation. Yeah. Okay, a proclamation declaring the month of May affordable housing month. Actually, okay. I'm asking for a resolution, not a proclamation. Oh, you yes. already turned down the proclamation, so I'm asking for a resolution. Oh, I thought I heard you say proclamation. Sorry. No. I okay. said it. <laughs> okay, so th those in support, uh, please thumbs up. I wanted to say something. Else. Oh, again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, again, we are discussing the merits of this, not, um, which is what we're not supposed to do, but... I think it's interesting that whenever um, certain subjects are brought before us for a proclamation, then they are scrutinized more highly than others. Um, we declared two proclamations just a couple of minutes ago for two issues that are very important and merit our time and our aff affirmation, but, um, <coughs> but issues like housing and other um, are often highly scrutinized, and I think that we need to be fair and we need to... Um, um, apply our openness to this, these discussions across the table uh, when they're when they're asked for when they're requested by us it's for a good reason especially housing we have not been the best at um, providing housing affordable or otherwise for our folks on uh, the lower income spectrum thank you right and we just did fair housing that's what we're saying so Which okay so those who want to housing. all right I think we need to uh, end the discussion going on and just uh, those who wish to support this resolution supporting oh. bringing the resolution to the council support and bringing item. the resolution to the count okay as a future agenda right. item I see one I see two three four five okay it's five to two <clears throat> so all right and then council member marks you had something Uh, yes, I do. I would like to uh, suggest a study session between the City of Gilroy and uh, the Gilroy Garlic Festival organization because there has been so much that's out there in the public that I don't think there's any transparency because we're not getting the full story and the public's not getting the full story. And I think we need to allow the public the right to hear a full discussion with everyone present on what is actually going on, why people made the decisions they've made. So, and, and we could do this in August or September. It's not anything urgent because I don't think the Garlic Festival is ready to go on this year anyway, but I think we owe it to the public, the taxpayers, to hear everyone's side. So your request is for a study session? Yes. So a separate meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy, that's, you're aware of that? What, what this, Madam Mayor, what this would entail would be an invitation to the Garlic Festival Board of Directors to have a co-meeting with the council. Uh, I could certainly coordinate that and identify a date um, as uh, Council Member Marks has uh, suggested for later in the summer, early in the fall, okay. uh, to have an open meeting and discuss those topics. We'd invite their entire board. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, Council Member Mayor, Chilvar. if I may, um, uh, I've, I've been in contact with the Christopher family regarding something very similar to this. So... Um, I think that um, this was something we were going to bring forward in the future, but since uh, Councilmember Marks has brought it up, I'm, I'm all in favor of it, but I think that we should also get the Christopher family involved as well in this discussion. The Yeah, I don't no. think so, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> they're just, a, they're a sponsor. Yeah. They're a sponsor. They're not on the board, but okay. So uh, can we have, are you, oh, are you waiting to speak? Councilmember Armendariz? Um, I think I could skip it if everybody's ready to vote. Okay. Yeah. So those in favor of a study session with the board of directors of the Garlic Festival Association. Because they're not on the board of the Garlic Festival Association. But, but it would be a public meeting. Yeah, they could certainly they attend. Could mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that appears unanimous. So that'll be an extra meeting to be scheduled this year. Okay, are we moving on then from future agenda items and on to the consent calendar? 
I'm going to start by asking if any council member wishes to remove an item from consent. Seeing none, wait, wait, then I got to open public comment. Are there any public comments on consent items? I received no speaker cards, Madam Mayor. Okay, then closing public comment and. I'll take a motion to approve the consent calendar. <laughs> all right, we have a motion by Council Member Bracco, seconded by Council Member Armanderis to approve all items on the consent calendar. Uh, oh, digital voting. Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. All right, item seven, bids and proposals. We have none. Item eight, introduction of new business. City Council position on proposed Santa Clara Valley Water District's ballot measure concerning board member term limits. Uh, Jimmy, you're going to give us this report. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, before you is an item that has been on the agenda for Valley Water. And uh, in advance of to evening, this evening's uh, meeting, you've been provided the staff report that was provided to the, their board by their staff. And also you received a fact sheet from uh, the administration of the water district with uh, just a measure of facts. So those were provided to you uh, for consideration. The, uh, the ballot measure uh, that has been approved by the Board of Directors of Valley Water is uh, for uh, June 7, 2022. And uh, I will simply read the, the ballot language and then um, ask you for uh, any policy direction you may uh, choose to go with. Um, a yes vote of the ballot measure supports authorizing an amendment to the Santa Clara County or Santa Clara Valley Water District Ordinance limiting district board members to no more than four consecutive terms and establishing four year term limits. A no vote opposes authorizing an amendment regarding term limits for board members to the Santa Clara Valley Water District Ordinance. Um, it only requires a simple majority of, for approval of Measure A. Uh, the fact sheet that is included uh, in your in your packet and for your information references uh, the current uh, term limits that the Valley mm -hmm. Water Board has, which is three four-year terms. So that's 12 years, and the ballot measure would move that to 16 years. Uh, so the policy direction that council is <laughs> requested to consider is one: uh, council could just decide not to take a position. Uh, you could take a position to uh, support this ballot measure, or you could take a position to not support this ballot measure. So that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Okay. So I see uh, the lineup starting. So uh, if you'd like to speak, please make sure your name is on the board. Okay. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Jimmy, is this information that we've been provided is the first we're seeing it right now, correct? It wasn't, I mean, we weren't given any information prior to this. There is a staff report and there is the resolution in the, in the agenda packet, but the information you have here, which is the measure A fact sheet was given to us right before the meeting. And then I circulated the uh, Valley Water staff report earlier today. No, no, and I appreciate that. I'm, I'm not, I guess my question is who provided the information to you, this information that we're just getting? Uh, I, the fact sheet was provided by Valley Water, the staff report I have, uh, tamed from their website. Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess the question is is this information that we asked for from them before and we're just getting now? They provided the fact sheet on their own. Uh, we included the staff report after discussions with Valley right. Water in order to give you uh, their staff report, which we did not include in the original uh, agenda packet. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Armanderis. Jimmy, is the, the language that they're providing to us that seems um, a bit, uh, well, it seems to me that it's saying they would limit current and future terms, right, to four four-year terms. The language reads as if they previously had no term limits, correct? But, and I think that's in the report, when in fact they had a three-year, a three-term for three four-year term limits. Is that the language that's been approved by the registrar or by the state to be on the ballot? It is my understanding that the language I, I read to you for a yes support or no is the language that has been approved it's at been this approved. point and would be included on the June 7th ballot. Yes. Okay, thank you. Council Member Marks. Jimmy, could you please share with the public how much this ballot measure is going to cost? Uh, included in the Valley Water staff report that they provided to their board of directors, it is estimated that it could cost up to $3.3 million to place on the ballot. However, that number could be reduced depending on the number of items on that ballot if there were other measures or other elections to be held. But that mm -hmm. was what they reported to their board. All right, thank you. I have a follow-up question. 
Okay, uh, Peter, did you have a question? Okay, I'm gonna let him go next and then come back. Jimmy, I'm, I'm just a little confused as to how this kind of even came to us for consideration. Was this brought to us by the district asking us? Or was this on our own initiative? Uh, no, this was not brought to us by the district. That This was on our own initiatives. We do occasionally bring uh, items to the council to honor their support. We also give them the option of not voicing any opinion at all on the matter. So um, it's not all that unusual, but uh, yeah, we did generate this. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I have no further questions this time. Thank you. Okay. Back to council member Armendariz. The um, $3.3 million, that, the cost that it will cost the Valley Water District or, um, you know, indirectly to voters, but, or is that the cost of the county to put this particular ballot measure on the ballot? I believe that when you place a ballot measure on the, um, on the ballot, you have to pay for it. Correct. Uh, so I would assume that this comes out of their revenues or, or their funding source. Mm -hmm. so I don't want to get too in the details because I'm not the expert on their, their budget, but most likely uh, it comes through their revenues. That's at cost to Valley Water. Yes. Okay. Is, Thank my you understanding is this is money paid by... By voters. By, well, paid by <laughs> Valley Water to the county. Right. So where Valley Water gets it is another matter. Right. <laughs> That's my question. Yeah, I think the Registrar of Voters charges the county and any agency for whatever it is they put on the ballot. Right. So anything that goes on the ballot is going to be paid for by the, by the jurisdiction that it's coming from. <clears throat> yeah, and it is, it, they do currently have three four-year term limits, and they have to wait at least four years before they can do another three three-year term limits. So they just can't do a consecutive loop. So this is... This is them asking the voters if they can extend their term limits to four. And so it's for this council now to decide if you want to give an opinion at all, support, deny, or no Madam opinion. Mayor? Oh, yeah. Yes, public comment. Public comment. Um, I've received no speaker cards, Madam Mayor. Okay. <clears throat> Closing public comment. Back to council. I'd, oh, go ahead. I would just motion no. Um, that we not opine on this one. Did we say that again? No, take no action. Yeah, take no action. I'll second that. Okay, and now I see uh, Peter's on the board and uh, Zach is on the board. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to suggest mm -hmm. as well. I mean, the, the, the alleged rationale for this is allowing greater consistency to provide for expertise for people who understand difficult concepts to remain on the, on the district board, but... Um, I mean, I don't, I don't feel that I have a solid enough understanding of, of how complex those things are and how much this really needs to happen. So I'm of the opinion that we should, uh, we should stay out of this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilmember Hilton, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I'm just going to say I'm in favor of term limits. I, I understand them. I think they're a good thing. I'm glad that Valley Water actually is an elected body and not appointed. Um, but at $3.3 million, when they're getting ready to raise rates, just doesn't seem fiscally responsible to me. I was ready to say no. And don't support it, but if you all want to just take a no, no action, I, I can follow along with that too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really indifferent myself, um, even though I am a supporter of the three, not the four. But I can do that at my own ballot, so I don't need to have the, I, I don't need it to be a council thing. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to take no no position on this. So vote. Okay. Yes. Aye. Councilmember Lira Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tavar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. All right, item 8.2 Progress update on the unhoused ad hoc committee recommendations. And uh, Jimmy, no, Bryce. Hi, Bryce. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so tonight we're giving an update on the progress of the recommendations of City Council for uh, the unhoused. Uh, just a real quick background, there's 14 recommendations in total, uh, 12 were recommended by the unhoused ad hoc committee, and then council added two when they finally approved it. Um, the committee ended its work on October 18th, 2021, at which point oversight transitioned to the city council. Uh, staff continued to work on those recommendations uh, as time has gone on. Um, so the slides are presented in order of the status of the project. So 
I want to start off with the pending items. So these are items that either have not yet started or are in the early stages of starting. Uh, so first is ensuring the county, state, water district, and private property owners are accountable for maintaining their properties in clean condition. So the program administrator is developing outreach materials uh, to send out to property owners regarding their responsibilities to maintain their property. Uh, the plan is that once that outreach is completed, uh, they'll be working with code enforcement uh, in order to develop the best procedures and process going forward to make sure that they, they are indeed held accountable for that property. Um, the city does continuously notify Caltrans, Valley Water, um, and the state when their properties require upkeep. Um, we do have mixed results whether they actually do respond in a timely manner to clean up their properties or not. The second item, uh, second recommendation is organization of community cleanup days. Uh, so at this time, um, we have not uh, had such a, uh, a no such um, event has been coordinated yet that the city led. Uh, we have had a couple of um, local organizations that uh, tried to initiate their own events, some successful, some not. Um, but this subject is the topic of conversation in the next quarter for the um, unhoused service providers task force that's, that's gathered together. And the third one that's in the pending status is researching an agency to provide drug rehab, job training, and job placement. At this time, we've not identified a nonprofit agency to provide the drug rehabilitation services in Gilroy. Uh, we did find two in San Jose um, that do serve um, those that are like fiscally challenged, um, but they generally have to be associated with some type of project or program. Um, it's not something that anybody can just generally walk in on. Um, there's quite a few commercial ones where if you have insurance or you're willing to pay for it, um, but again, those are mostly up, located up in San Jose. Um, one of the challenges is that we are a smaller population. Um, we have quite a bit of distance between us and uh, the adult drug courts that are in San Jose. Um, so that, that presents a challenge because they like to locate near where their clientele, for lack of a better term, would be. Um, we are working on a grant right now with the Department of Justice uh, to look at using that grant potentially to work with another agency to maybe financially incentivize them to come and provide services down here. Um, but we have to find a, an associated organization in order to provide that service. So we're continuing to work on that one uh, with a grant application period ending at the end of this month. Um, so we'll, we'll keep the council updated on the progress of that, uh, that effort. And then the job training and placement is the next area of focus um, once we get the uh, drug rehabilitation service identified. Uh, the next slide are those projects that are in progress at this point in time. Uh, so the first is a safe parking program. Um, we, as council recall, we had an unsuccessful RFP process uh, for the first um, attempt at the safe parking program. Uh, we did have one submittal uh, from the Compassion Center. Um, the city, the Compassion Center, and Santa Clara County have entered uh, discussions on the program, uh, uh, but at this point, there is no formal agreement with the city at this time. Um, with some challenges related to property location for the safe parking program, uh, it remains possible that a suitable location may be found, at which point then the city can consider uh, contributing perhaps PLHA funds uh, towards case management or one of the other services associated with the safe parking program. Um, so again, this is one thing, this is one that uh, the work is continuing and we'll continue to monitor and update council as we go. And then the third is explore, um, I'm sorry, second is the support of a mobile garbage removal program. Um, so with council's approval, we did approve uh, enter into a contract with US Ecology uh, for a budget of $100,000. Um, we have spent about 50900 uh, which has entailed three cleanups, uh, Highway 101 and 152 interchange. Uh, that was the, the largest one that we had. Uh, cleanup at Wrens Lane on the eastern side, and then also a, a dump site at Hirosaki on the north side of town. Uh, we are considering options for one-day dumpster availabilities for unhoused, um, basically located at their encampments to help discard whatever refuse they have. Um, the one challenge that we have heard both from um, from the experiences of the Compassion Center, but also U.S. Ecology, is that once those uh, dumpsters are placed, it quickly becomes where it gets out that, hey, there's a place we can just dump whatever we want. Um, so we're working to try to find a way to set up the program where uh, it's a same-day drop-off, same-day pickup, and it somehow it's monitored in order to prevent illegal dumping from happening there. And then the third one is exploring the purchase of a garbage compactor truck. Uh, we did have an unsuccessful procurement for the compactor truck. Um, however, afterwards, uh, staff who are involved in the cleanups on the city side uh, did recommend that a custom dump truck body would be a, a better selection than the compactor truck uh, for a couple of reasons. One, usability with the license. Um, two, also is the concerns about compacting garbage with potentially biohazard and having issues about cross-contaminating uh, the full load. Um, so at this point, bids were then uh, submitted for a uh, custom-built dump truck. 
Uh, unfortunately, we again did not have any successful bids for that one, but we did have one that uh, proposed a custom uh, dump body bed. Um, so that uh, is the option that uh, staff pursued. Um, that is under construction currently slated for mid-summer uh, delivery. Uh, fleet and code enforcement staff have visited uh, the construction in progress and uh, no issues or concerns with the design uh, has been identified at this time. Uh, next are those that are completed. Um, so the first one is the endorsement of the community plan in homelessness. Uh, council did approve that, uh, that endorsement resolution. Uh, the second one was exploring the differences between, between a police officer and a community service officer. Again, that was completed uh, with the committee as far as deciding to proceed with a police officer. And third is the hiring of the quality of life officers. And so uh, there were two officers selected that are currently serving in this role. Um, there will be future updates to accounts regarding that program uh, as it progresses. By the fourth category are recommendations that are continuing and ongoing. Uh, so the first one is whenever possible be proactive and support affordable housing efforts. Uh, again, this is an ongoing business practice and so staff will continue to support uh, ongoing affordable housing efforts in collaboration with council and local unhoused um, service providers and that the city now has connections with those service providers with the county in order to connect to resources that we previously didn't have or didn't utilize. Uh, partnering with the city of Morgan Hill, again, this is also an ongoing business practice. Uh, we have been working with the city of Morgan Hill on various regional approaches. Um, and ultimately, uh, their housing manager, Rebecca Garcia, has been a great resource for Gilroy in pursuing programs and identifying information and issues uh, that we encounter. Uh, third is continuing support for homeless service providers through the CDBG grant funding. Um, so that is action item that is on tonight's agenda as well. Um, so council authorized uh, funding for back in, for the 2021 year, and tonight it will be considering the 2022 um, allocations. Uh, next is the coordination of the monthly check-in meetings with the local, uh, with the lead homeless service providers um, to address local homeless issues. Uh, city staff, the, the program administrator, has uh, re-engaged local service providers uh, and have facilitated monthly meetings since January. Uh, they're now calling themselves unhoused service providers, uh, which is the renamed task force. Uh, their attendance has increased from eight to 22 attendees. Uh, currently, they're working on planning, including uh, drafting goals and developing working themes and strategies as well as response plans for unhoused during inclement weather. Um, the monthly meetings are planned to continue, uh, and the primary benefit of the meeting is that there's now collaboration networking that's happening uh, more along with the city. And then finally, partnering with the county office of supportive housing, uh, establishing a partnership to have access to their programs and services. Uh, this collaboration continues to develop. Um, this is one of the, the benefits is the PLHA funding program that's being discussed later tonight. Um, the city has continued to work with Office of Supportive Housing to identify locations for like Measure A home, or Measure A housing projects, um, and then that the connections to interagency collaboration has been expanding as we've as we've proceeded along on these uh, recommendations, and it's expected to continue uh, throughout the efforts forthcoming. Um, so that completes the presentation. Happy to address any questions or comments. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, make sure you're on the board. Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a few, but I have two that are related. Can I ask those two first? Okay. Okay. Um, Bryce, thank you, and Crystal and your team for your work on this. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the cleanups and the dumpsters, the cleanups seem incredibly expensive for having, there's only been three or four, right? And it's Correct. we've spent 150000 Can you tell us in detail a little bit more why they're so expensive? Yeah, so uh, we, we've we've spent uh, so fifty thousand of the one hundred thousand been spent. Okay. Um, so the largest part at thirty thousand was the highway one fifty two and one hundred one interchange, just because of the large area, and the challenge that we have uh, the cost increase. Obviously, labor is a large part of that, but also is uh, the waste uh, disposal. Since there is bio waste in there, it takes extra special steps and procedures, right. not just for the handling at the site, but also for the shipping and disposing of it as well. So it's a combination of those two costs are the okay. large parts. Thank you. And then um, regarding the dumpsters, have we reached out to our local um, orgs like Pit Stop, Compassion Center, or maybe some civic orgs to partner on keeping an eye on those dumpsters or just keeping them there for a limited amount of time so that somebody could keep an eye on them so that they're not used by the neighborhood or folks who aren't unhoused? Yeah, so that's we haven't just explored that with them specifically yet, but that's one of the part of this conversation we're going to have with them this next quarter with them on the cleanup days is to include that that as well as so try to see what kind of services we can 
kind of come together and, and collaborate on. So if they can provide oversight. The one question would be how, you know, we'd have to explore with them and also with risk managers, how far can they go to actually intervene between somebody trying to access and what's the risk levels there. So yeah. that's something we do have to explore with them, but that is something in our consideration once we see it. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Bracco. Are we going to be reimbursed for cleaning up uh, Caltrans's highway? Uh, we're we're going to submit for it, um, but as far as I know, uh, the, as I can't guarantee, you know, their response, but we are going to be submitting a claim to them. Council Member Bracco, we have submitted a request that we are, I wouldn't hold your breath on not getting a check. But okay. We did also, on the garbage compactor truck, the reason that the subcommittee recommended that was a, rec was a request from our police department because you can throw couches in there, mattresses, and it compacts them down. And now we're just getting a dump truck. Why, why is uh, staff overriding council's decision? I don't think that's right. It should have came back to the council because we have dump trucks. So it, it feels like to me uh, we're just crossing something off of staff's want list and paying for it with this money. Council Member Bracco, that was a recommendation from the ad hoc committee and it falls within the purview of our purchasing ability to make those adjustments. We had numerous issues that would have driven that cost and would have made it not sustainable at all. And, and one is being that if you compact garbage and you have biohazard in it, you then have a responsibility. Uh, in determining what the proper vehicle would be, that was something we couldn't take on. We don't have the ability to, so we wouldn't have anything at all. And so um, our staff who was out there daily uh, working on the, the, the cleanup areas have found this to be the most effective tool to do the most work. Um, in some of these situations, uh, yeah, sure, we could bring that back to council, but we make decisions and we still feel that was the right decision to make because that's the only thing practical for the work we're doing out there. Um, compacting things like mattresses and couches um, are helpful, but we also have alternate ways to get that. We have a mattress uh, collection uh, date here coming up in a few weeks. We also have been working with Recology on their contract with the city to provide more opportunities for people to dump very large items. So we felt with all that going on, this was the best thing for us to do for our, our employees and for the effectiveness of the program. I think in the future, it should come back to the council because we see the water district, they use compactor trucks and they don't seem to have a problem. So I, I think it would uh, be best for everyone if it came back to council and let us uh, know why uh, our, our request is being changed. Okay, uh, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blakely. Um, Bryce, I'm, I'm happy to see that there, there's an increase in the, um, that task force that, that staff is putting on and Crystal is putting on that from eight to 22 attendees. Um, what kind of uh, metrics or evaluation um, is staff thinking like once a year come back with you know, recommendations and where this group is going? Because I know that a lot of the um, providers in this group have been advocates for years and in their own worlds and their, you know, and it's nice for them to come together, but is there, besides just having a, 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 a meeting once a month, like what's gonna, out, what's gonna be the outcome from it? And are there gonna be recommendations that are coming from it? Or will they be presenting to us like once a year? So like, I, what makes it worth it for you all to continue it? So I'd have to uh, defer to our program administrator, but I believe, uh, if you can put me wrong, but I believe that's the um, the purpose of the uh, the work plans they're doing, the strategy sessions. But a little warm up from my other two reports. <laughs> um, you know, definitely. You know, the city had been part of uh, the group uh, for years, like you mentioned, but actually we took on facilitating it again um, starting in January and that was actually the first thing that we did in January is to send out, send out a survey see like hey how was it before where are you now where do we want to be so we kind of started off with that as like our first meeting um, and that's you know it has only been since January I feel like the group has come on a long way but that is definitely one of the things that we're working on one of the things uh, is to have there is a vision and there are strategies very specific strategies that the group has drafted um, I just wanted to solidify them more to like 
have them be um, set. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to say that. The last meeting we had, it was is still in draft. So that is definitely the goal. And um, annually, we do want to make sure that we're meeting. We we want to have it be like smart, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. That's the whole kind of point of this. Um, but also, there's been a lot of uh, great points that the group has come together and d decided that this is the direction we want to go. So um, I, I could explain more in the next time, but I didn't print out my the, the drafted things. Thank you. Okay. okay, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Bryce, I have two questions. First of all, thank you to your team, yourself and your team for the work that you guys are doing. Um, my first question was partly answered by um, the city administrator, as you recall, a while back ago, I pushed for the uh, mattress removal program. Um, and um, Jimmy just mentioned that's going to be happening soon. Do we know the exact date and how are we going to be promoting that to the, to the community? A uh, specific date is not known at this point in time, but yes, we will put that out through our social media avenues as well. And then uh, we may work with uh, the task force as well to get information out for them as well. Okay, thank you. Second uh, question. Um, in regards to the garbage removal and the, the garbage truck and the community cleanup, um, and forgive me if, if, um, if I misunderstood, but I, I think during our ad hoc um, committee discussions, we talked about a possible program where um, not only to um, focus in on certain areas, but focus in citywide. And I had shared there's a city, I think it was Mountain View, they have a garbage cleanup day once a month where residents can put garbage, you know, and we would go around and pick it up and just sort of something that, from my understanding from their uh, council, it's a very successful program. It helps clean, it helps keep their city clean. Is that a discussion that we, or something that we're looking into? Uh, it is, it's one of the considerations, I believe that, the, so there's certain community cleanup events, but again, it, one of the things would be, A, so the U.S. Ecology contract is, it's just too cost prohibitive to, to try to use them for that process. Um, I know that in the for a new franchise agreement, which may include right. cleanup events. Um, so we're looking at options, but no, no firm plan at this point. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tovar, the date of the mattress event is June 4th. June 4th. And uh, Bryce is correct. When the city staff brings back to you the recology agreement, you're going to see a lot more community sure. engagement and community opportunities for waste disposal due to uh, restrictions of a lot of the, uh, if you've ever been to the dump, like the San Martin transfer station, it is uh, quite expensive. Right. So we're, we're working hard on that and we should be with council here shortly with some of the ideas that we have. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I have a question, Bryce. Sure. Um, on the safe parking mm -hmm. program, does in progress mean that um, we've got some new information coming or is this just, we've tried certain things and we just haven't gotten anywhere yet? So it's it's uh, so the in progress designation is that we've 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 made progress work so that it's not pending anymore. It's it's something that's currently underway, uh, has some good depth, but we haven't finished it yet. It's still something that's in progress and trying to determine a, a, a way to achieve that that project goal. Right, because we still only have one uh, one offer to run a safe parking program, right? Uh, we actually uh, the council actually uh, voted to cancel that RFP, so we end up. Uh, engaging directly with Compassion Center, the only one that submitted to see what kind of program would be useful um, or possible with them. And so I, you know, unfortunately, a discussion difficult to defer to Crystal as far as where that is at this point. Yeah, time, I was just but. wondering if there's a, if there's anything identified there at all um, that we could possibly. That, I'm asking for what the update is. What is it? What is it in terms of a location and in terms of a total cost that we think we might be able to manage? Since what was submitted before was something not manageable. Yeah. So at this point, I, there's not really a, a plan at this point. That, that that nothing concrete. So we're still waiting to see. From my understanding, they're working with the county on a potential location, and once that's resolved, if it's going to happen or not, uh, at that point we would have a little more information that we could base going forward. So at this point, it's, it's just a continuing item. There's no real update as far as any new information that we have for specifics. Okay, is that the same location though that we're trying to get Measure A funds for housing? I think so. Okay, thank you. Oh, Councilman Barmadaris? Yes. Um, my questions are regarding the quality of life officers. Um, can you, or are you aware of the different trainings or um, in particular regarding resources, approaches, and um, 
a difference again between the our regular officers and the quality of life officers like what's what um, what's being offered to them and no, unfortunately I don't have that information uh, I don't know if Captain Powell's available I know uh, Chief Espinoza gave a presentation uh, before on it then the other one question would be about the like uh, are they keeping particular sets of data about what they're encountering just so we know the difference between what our regular officers are doing and what these folks are doing definitely as far as data goes they're keeping track of all their contacts and resources provided and those people that they're actually getting into housing um, as far as training goes yes there's a different training track that they're involved in um, I don't have specific names of the training they're going to but for example like restorative justice training they're going to that kind of stuff currently what they're doing is going around and going to other cities that have quality life officer positions and they're learning from those positions that have been in existence for over a year now so we're learning from other agencies and other cities that have existing programs okay thank you okay seeing no other questions uh, from council I'll go to the public if this yeah public comment I received no speaker cards madam mayor okay closing public comment and this is there's really no action here except to receive the report so with that we will move on to agenda item 8.3 Approval of a permanent local housing allocation five-year expenditure plan and Crystal is going to give us this report Hello everybody This is exciting. I want to come every Monday <laughs> <laughs> I get to be here yeah. Dad's taking care of the kids This is perfect um, Yeah, so so today we're oh, Hold the microphone closer? closer to you to right your here? mouth They're right here Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, um, I'm going to try to not keep the report too long since we have two. This one is the shorter one, so I'll try to get through it as fast as uh, we, we can. So just a little bit of the background um, on the PLHA. It's the Permanent Local Housing Allocation Fund. Uh, and, uh, Oct late last year, October 2021, um, dialogues uh, started with the county and actually made us aware of the PLHA funding source. And so uh, council on the 15th uh, said that we can go ahead and um, approve the participation of it. In December, we actually signed the agreement. Is it, is it not on? Oh. Oh, <laughs> that looks better. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so signed in December and um, we really wanted to make sure that we kept in mind with the, this fund that our public service grant program uh, would benefit as well as um, other potential programs down the line like a down payment assistance program and it would um, make funds available down the road like Bryce had mentioned for a safe parking program or kind of other qualifying needs. Um, it also addressed um, that for fiscal year 22-23 we actually have a depleting HTF uh, a housing trust fund balance um, and for this reason the, the council approximated uh, only a hundred thousand dollars which it historically had done 168 um, but through this fund you can make 168 available plus more so that is definitely one of the benefits uh, quickly about the agreement it is um, going to be administered under the Office of Supportive Housing for the county. It is a five-year term and we decided this is uh, other cities are in this consortium and uh, they kind of did their kind of different version so this is just very specific for Gilroy and we decided we wanted to do of um, the amounts that that were allocated to do 50% homeless prevention and this is across five years 20% basic needs and then 30% for the down payment assistance program. The percentage breakdowns is in the first two years, it would be homeless uh, prevention and basic needs. The reason we didn't um, go ahead and just do the down payment assistance, we weren't ready. Like we don't have a down payment assistance program. So we thought we needed to give ourselves uh, some time to make sure that that's uh, developed. So that would start in the third year and go on to the, to the fifth year of that plan. Um, 
good news. The first two years have already been awarded, so we already know what that what that amount is. And then the following three years are based on projections. Um, staff continues to talk with the county about uh, different processes, um, especially you know depending how much is going to be put where. Like for instance, uh, we'll we'll see in the in the plan. Um, you know, if we have to pursue modifications. So the plan that I'm going to be presenting is, uh, so like I explained the first two years, that is the amount, oh, by the way, this is a, it, this is excluding the county's 5% fee. Um, and then, so the first two years, it kind of has them lumped together, but on the report, it actually has the, the plan. So if you wanted to see what it would look like for year one, and year two, you can you can see that on there. And then if you see year three and five, um, you don't see basic needs in there. It's um, homeless prevention, but it is a category under it. So actually, no, there's 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 none available there because we expended all of it in the first two years. And then the down payment assistance program starts um, in that uh, that third year. So the total amount would be would make available one point three nine million. So these are your options. Uh, accept the funding allocations negotiated with the county, which is what I just presented. Um, and if you choose to keep this plan, um, no further action or agreement is needed. Um, or if you would like to request to change the percentages of the five-year plan, then, then we can discuss that. All right, thank you. Council Member Lerone Munoz. Crystal, oh, thank I'm you so for sorry. the- um, I'm so sorry, I forgot. Oh, have I, have, I have one more slide. I'm Go so right sorry. ahead. I don't have it in front of me, like the whole the whole amount. Um, the fiscal impact, just quickly, uh, this does provide, like I mentioned, it, it does provide new resources and aid to the city. It helps, um, you know, like we were mentioning earlier, does a, a, a make available supporting more affordable housing. Um, it also helps our city's unhoused homeless populations. Um, and the fact that the county is administrating uh, the fee, it actually, we're not, the city is not going to receive any of the funds so um, directly, so there is no fiscal impact. Um, oh, this is the this is the the plan that I also printed out in the report. Just if you wanted to see more of a breakdown um, of what it would be every year, and then what the basic what what the percentages of homeless prevention and basic needs would have to be met. Um, there is a little bit of flexibility in here about. 10%, but uh, we, we tried to keep it to, to to this right now. Okay, okay. you might want to leave the prior slide up oh, just because okay. it's got information on it, but I don't know what people's questions are. Council Member okay. yeah, That's helpful. Uh, Crystal, thank you for the report. And, and I probably missed this in here, but you know, I, I think it's pretty clear when we look at the funding categories, like homeless prevention, I think we all kind of get that. And you know, down payment assistance, I think we all kind of get that. What is comprised or of um, a basic need? What 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 kind of services are we are we actually doing there? So in oh, and I guess I could get it. Um, I'll read it right off the agreement. That, that's helpful because and the context for it is is we're deciding about the allocations. I just think it'd be helpful to know specifically what it is that's yes. provided under that category. Big attachment. Hmm. Okay, so it is. In, okay, so it is. Uh, so twenty percent would be towards the basic services uh, for homelessness, including the costs associated with administering maybe a free parking program. Um, um, wait, it's hard to hear you. Can oh, you? I'm either, so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Just either speak more slowly or into the mic. Um. It's basically for those those at risk of uh, experiencing homelessness, ex including but not limited to provided wrapping, rehousing, rental assistant assistance, a supportive case management service, uh, services to allow people to obtain or retain housing, operating, and capital costs for navigating centers, emergency centers. Um, just a, a few of the examples that they had there. Okay, I'm I'm just trying to get a sense for how that differs from the homeless prevention. It sounds more like 
homeless prevention, mm -hmm. that those are expenditures for programs for people who are currently housed, but maybe at risk of going, becoming unhoused. And basic needs are for those who are homeless who need those uh, supplies, services. And that's yeah, more, yeah. Oh, sorry. Preven <laughs> prevention is, no, you, yeah. you and I are thinking in the same direction. Yeah. Prevention is preventing the problem, and then the uh, basic needs is the intervention for those who are already yeah. finding themselves in that state. Okay, that's that's helpful. I just and then to, like item, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just need to clarify in my own mind. I'm a little slow sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good question. <laughs> thank you. All right, Council Member Marks. Okay, thank you, Crystal. I have a few questions. Um, where does the PLHA funds come from? Is that are they coming from the county? From the um, uh, HCD, I believe. Yes. Oh, okay. And then for the down payment assistance program. Who qualifies for that or who can apply? That's a great question. That's uh, what we're giving ourselves two years to figure out. So that's why we um, we decided that we would, we, we knew that it was going to be to support either, you know, getting into like a, maybe a BMR property or, you know, it, it's, if you see the amount, it's, it's not like we have a million dollars to help people get into homes. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to figure out how we're going to be getting folks into um, into house, so they would house. have to be at a certain economic level, right? Um, maybe extremely that's what we low envision. income. Is yeah, what you that's envision. what we would envision for that. All right, it's not it's not a fully developed program. That's where we're giving ourselves two years for. But it would be specifically to get people into homes that maybe otherwise they couldn't. I, either could that could be like okay, maybe we can't, you know, give thirty percent, twenty percent down, but maybe we can help with ten percent down, and that gets that person in a home. I so see. that could be an example. All right. And then what safeguards are in place to guarantee that these funds are used appropriately by all the nonprofits? Well, we go through a pretty thorough, um, uh, the same process that CDBG, that you'll see in the next report, that CDBG goes through. We have had that same process for getting applications, monitoring, you know, all those things with the which was the housing trust funds that will now become PLHA funds. So we're handing that over, and that's part of the, what we're doing with the county, is handing that over. They, they want to know, okay, how did, you, um, how did you figure out these amounts for these people? Because now they're going to have it. Mm -hmm. And so um, the process is still a little unknown. We're still figuring that out right now, the administration mm -hmm. part. But now that will only be, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> now it's going to, uh, non, uh, nonprofits will now have to apply through the county and then they will come to the city and give their recommendations and then we will say okay this is we recommend ABC and give it back to them and then they ultimately decide all right thank you okay council member Armendariz thank you mayor um, regarding the down payment assistance is this for it sounds to me like this is for home buyers versus folks trying to get into a rental unit. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's oh, it's the, solely for folks trying to buy a home. Um, it's not in stone yet, but it is the kind of the the nego when we were going through negotiations and just kind of thinking of what where these percentages were going to go into, and we thought of the down payment assistance program. It was to get families into homes for purchase. For purchase. And is, is that something that um, the data speaks to regarding the folks in our community, in Gilroy? I mean, I think in general, in the county, knowing what, um, you know, income levels are and the how hard it is to even find a rental here, let alone a home. So we definitely um, see a need there for that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a rental assistance programs that we know are in the community and we are helping and supporting um, in that sense. We're not forgetting our, our renters. We just want to make sure that aside from what locally and state um, funds are offering for rentals, that we also offer something for our our folks that want to buy a home here and that's, or, or are forced to not be able to live here. And that's not met by uh, our other program? Uh, our down payment assistance program? Correct. We don't have a down payment assistance program. Okay. We, we help with, uh, we have BMR properties that we, that we help and we manage, and that's actually how we have been able to fund the housing trust fund. Um, 
through the sales of and the equity shares of, of those homes. Um, but this, this would be, uh, it, it would be needed in the community. I don't have the research in front of me, um, but it is something that, that we have had uh, great interest in. Okay, thank you. Council Member Bracco. Do we know the percentages of how much of it will actually reach the client versus administration and retirements and all that? Uh, you mean the fee, the 5% fee? Well, the money that they take out of this. 5%. It's, that's, it's a straight 5%? It's a straight 5%, okay, yeah, thank for the you. five years, yeah. So to, to clarify numbers-wise, this $1.39 that we are being asked to approve, right, is for, is to be spent over five years, yes. right? And we are being asked tonight to approve the plan of 50, 20, 30. Yes. Right? And, and not only 50, 20, 30, but how much in year one, two, three, five? Okay, sure. clear on that. All right, uh, how about we go to the public and see if we have any public comments on this? I received no speaker cards, Madam Mayor. Oh, oh there's one. Oh. <laughs> Look at who's late. I apologize. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, just come on up, David. I, uh, this is David Cox. Uh, good evening. It's lovely to see you. I've been kind of busy and under a rock for a while. So, <laughs> um, my only cautionary tale to the council. And uh, just wanted to say the staff here has been phenomenal. But to have county decide who they fund is challenging to me as a local organization. And I say that on behalf of the fellow organizations that are here and that apply every year. There is a deep, deep knowledge that this city has with its service providers. And I don't think we're going to get that with the county level. I also want to say is we have we have three contracts right now with Osh. I think we're good with them. They know we're a reliable partner, but I think it excludes that connectivity that we need with our local council, uh, the committees that look at this uh, funding source and things like that. To have the county decide, uh, you know, the service providers and what they might get down here, uh, to me that's just it's hard to decide because you know I I think we 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 want to protect and we want to. We always say we want to serve our constituency. We want to make sure these agencies get funded. And I think this particular path has some risk to it. Thank you. Okay, Crystal, do you want to come back? Oh, Dion, do you have another question? No, okay, then I, I have one. Um, we're, we're going this route because we had a couple of meetings prior to this, right? That uh, the housing trust fund, which was the way that we were funding, we can't anymore. The the money that was in there isn't. So this was what council decided to do in order to do anything at all, correct? Yes, um, the last slide here, it is, yeah, it is a, a depleting uh, Right, fund. this is the, the, the reason the we're, this that, route yeah. is because of the status of the housing trust fund that back when it started in the late 90s was working beautifully and now has been pretty much depleted. So it leaves us with no way to do it yeah. and, any other way. And just to, just to know, um, oh, it's not on there. I think it's on the other, on the CDBG one. Um, but in the, in the February meeting, oh, here it is, it's the last point. In, the, in that February meeting, um, council did um, up, say they would appropriate um, 100,000. So, right, instead so of 100. Even, even less than the, Historically awarded 168. Right. So I think, you know, there is great merit in the system that we have. It's just unfortunately it is the um, the funds. And, and also right. that is something, you know, that when we, we don't know the end yet, like, you know, we've, we've been given assurances and been very hopeful about right. our recommendations being at a, at a higher regard. And um, only time will tell in the process. Right, and if we can get the housing trust fund built back yeah. up again and, too. And it so. is a it is a is a five year plan. So right. after that time, if we decide, oh X Y and Z happened, we did like it, we didn't, then we can actually go into continue into a PLHA right. and run it ourselves. Okay, Jimmy, did you want to say something before I 
Move on. I did want to say something, Madam Mayor. We had significant dialogue with the county about that same concern that that gentleman shared because we don't we didn't want the money to go into a pool and then somebody say, well, here's a little bit for you to wear or not. We had to we had to take a little bit of a risk, and the risk is is that we could not do this program for five percent administration. We needed the county to do it for us, or uh, we would eat a significant amount of the funds that would not go to the service providers. We also have an out, and so we have a way after the five year agreement expires, we can decide to reevaluate and see how effective the county's been. So we're taking a little bit of chance there, but I, I feel very confident with our relationship that's been established. Uh, with that department of Office of Supportive Housing and the support we received from them when they weren't getting any money to get, you know, to really uh, to help us, uh, I'm very confident that we have a good relationship. And if it doesn't work out, we'll be back to you and, and, and tell you so and then make some recommendations to, to adjust. But um, we need their help in this situation. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Hilton. Thank you. Um, I just want to commend staff for, uh, you know, for, for finding these, these resources for us and it's only been a year since those recommendations have come out of the, the um, ad hoc committee, you know, and one of them was to join the community plan and homelessness. So we're all pulling in the same direction. Um, you know, that gave us a seat at the table also um, to be able to find these, these funding. So, you know, yes, endorsing the community plan and homelessness was a simple paper resolution, but it's planted the seed and it's got us this far. Um, and I just want to say too, for those organizations, if you feel that, um, that, you know, that you're not being represented, like, like the city administrator said, come here and tell us. Lean on us as the elected officials to, to, you know, to be your advocate. That's what we're here for, and I think staff's committed to be an advocate for you as well. Um, but I would be interested in hearing any and all feedback um, on how this goes. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Right now it is, is, uh, it's the unknown because we haven't even gone, um, I mean, right here for these two years and the report that's um, preceding this one, um, we'll set the next two years. So we'll, we'll know that. We'll know what the next two years looks like, um, could, depending on the, the options. Um, so it really is uh, the years after that. So there's some comfort in that, <laughs> that, that we at least know what the next two years uh, will be like, and then any, um, you know, what the application process looks like, what all that kind of process that is now outside of the city. Like, that's... Thank we'll you. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Armendaris. Um, thank you. Two questions. Why, um, I know staff has a lot on their plate, but I, I'm concerned that two years to establish a down payment assistance program, it seems like, like a lot. It seems like a stretch, especially given the way that housing prices are growing, you know, and um, it feels like that's going to give us too much time for our funding to go, not to go as far. So I'm, very um, I'm concerned about that. And then um, I'd just like to know more about what basic needs covers because I'm, I'm, I'm still not clear on what kind of services or resources that, that will provide. Uh, that was asked already, right? You mean right, in addition to what was, okay. Because it wasn't, it wasn't very clear. Okay. You might have to get, do you have any better information or would you like to get back yeah. to her after the meeting? Um, and I'd be yeah, okay I can with get that back too. To her more as in examples, and then you'll see also in the CDBG what we've classified as basic needs versus homeless prevention. Um, I just wanted to keep it a little separate from this because I didn't want to talk about the grant recipients in here when that's the next one. But as far as you know, not having the program start right away, we actually did that in deep consideration of our current service providers because if we did that in the first two years, that actually would not make this amount available to just our service providers. So um, again, these those two years are homeless, homeless prevention and basic needs. We thought that was um, a way to consider, you know, the, the, the last 10 or so years that, that um, you know, different things have been happening and then just to go <coughs> from one year to the next, it just really felt like not even having a hundred thousand, which doesn't cover it, you know, you, you'll, you'll see in the other ones. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to, one, we hadn't established, we don't have one developed yet. And then two, we wanted to make sure that our service providers, whichever option is, uh, they have those two years. Okay, thank you. Okay, so council, does anyone want to make a motion to uh, approve this five-year expenditure plan or something I'll, else? I'll make the motion. I just want to comment something okay. as well on that, is that we do have a partner called House Keys 
and uh, you know they are a partner to be able to help um, with anybody's concerns with down payment assistance. They have worked with that, um, but I'm happy to move uh, staff's recommendation. I'll second that, Mayor. Okay, so we have a motion mm -hmm. by. Councilmember Hilton, seconded by Councilmember Tovar, to approve the permanent local housing allocation five-year expenditure plan um, as, as recommended by staff. Okay. It's all digital voting. All right, that's uh, passed unanimously. Okay, moving on to 9.1, approval of... Approval of Community Development Block Grant and Permanent Local Housing Allocation Public Service Grant Allocations and Community Development Block Grant Annual Action Plan for Fiscal Year 22-23. Uh, before you get started, Crystal, I'd like to ask the Council if there's any ex parte communications to disclose. Mayor, um, no ex partes, but I'd like to recuse myself from this discussion and vote. Okay, thank you. No ex parte, okay. So, Crystal, go ahead. All righty, thank you. This one's a little bit longer, but I'm going to uh, breeze through some parts because we actually went, we just went through it with the KLHA report. Um, so just a little bit of a quick background with um, community development block grants um, that I'll reference as CDBG. Uh, it is, they're funds from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, HUD. And uh, there are several requirements that we need to meet in order to receive CDBG funds. Um, one, a, a few of them is holding two public hearings. This is the second one. It fulfills that requirement. Having a five-year consolidated plan, which is 2020-2025, uh, uh, and then submitting an um, annual action plan. Um, a little bit more of an overview. Um, we, you, CDBG uses entitlement funds, and you could use a variety of activities for that, as long as it meets a national objective, and then they have eligible activities. A few of those examples are public services, uh, meal delivery, health care, youth, um, and like housing rehabilitation. Again, these are just a few. I wanted to just kind of give an example. Also, as far as annual uh, CDBG allocations, uh, 15% go, goes towards public service grants, which is um, what we're going to be describing. 20% is the max for administrative costs, and the remainder goes for CDBG eligible uses. Um, and it's estimated um, for fiscal year 23 that we will have 470,000. So the annual action plan, um, a few things that we need to do, we need to approve the 2022-23 annual action plan. Um, we need to have a public hearing to receive comments um, for the draft annual um, action plan that was sent out 30 days ago. And then the annual action plan um, is, uh, is, is meant for specifically for the coming year. And it's referenced um, to supplant the PLHA um, consortium funding that we just uh, reviewed. Um, also part of the process is that, is that the Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization Committee, the HNRC, um, was tasked with evaluating and ranking um, public service and housing rehab applications. Uh, they were giving two options, option A and option B, um, and the HNRC did uh, choose option B at their March 19th, 9th meeting. Um, but at this time, the, we were still speaking with the county. Um, we, we didn't know if we could, we could be a sub-recipient, um, and that wasn't figured out till later on where we found out we couldn't. <laughs> so what that meant is that the minimums of, that we had set beforehand for, for both CDBG and at that time HTF um, had, to, had to increase. Um, so just really quickly, um, we talked about housing trust fund conversions to PLHA funds. Um, kind of already mentioned it's, you know, we used to give 168. Um, it is a depleting fund. Uh, the council did uh, only make 100,000 available. Um, and they also approved that staff recommendations of going into a PLHA uh, agreement. Um, 
I mentioned a little bit in the in in the previous report that HT those who were receiving HTF awards were treated just as CDBG. So the the and that's a that's a HUD program. So it was rigorous. The evaluation, the monitoring, everything that we did. It didn't matter if you were CDG, CDBG or HTF. It was thorough, and um, it was the same for everybody else. Um, uh, lastly, what is known is the, is the next um, is the next two years for PLHA funds totals five hundred and ninety two thousand, um, and that is uh, that would be what the option that's chosen chosen would be for the next two years. Um, quickly, we already went through this, so I'm just going to skip this slide. It was just the timeline of the PLHA. Um, a little bit more about the consortium agreement. Again, we kind of went through this. The funding category, it's a five-year term. Um, the, cons uh, the county um, is administering the funds. 50% uh, homeless prevention, 20% basic needs, 30% down payment assistance, um, and the percentage of the breakdowns would be the first uh, year one and two would focus on homeless prevention and basic needs, and then year three and five would um, maintain homeless prevention, um, and then the down payment assistance program um, would start. Um, also, the the first two years we are we already know are awarded, and then the the following three years are based on projections. So, quickly overview of the changes. Um, housing trust bus minimums that were seventy five hundred um, were raised with this PLHA agreement to 20,000. Um, um, also, the, the PLHA funding categories of homeless prevention and basic needs um, did have caps. Year one, it was 116,000 uh, each, and then year two was 180. Um, and also, reserves uh, could be used um, and were made into considerations when recommendations were given for items such as a, a future safe parking program or um, other services or goods that could qualify under homeless prevention uh, or basic needs. Um, I, I did want to take a second um, to mention that the original report that I sent out, uh, the formulas were correct, but three cells were corrupted. And uh, usually if I do a formula, I don't check every single cell after that. Um, my mistake, I did have um, tables available and then I did update these tables for option B, C, and D. Um, again, HNRC only received option A and B because at that time uh, this was not available. We didn't know minimums. We didn't know what it was really going to look like, but HNRC was, um, you know, because of HUD and CDBG, on timelines. So option A, even though it's included, is not an option. It's not available because I think that, that there were still $7,500 minimums on there, so that didn't qualify. Um, option B uh, does qualify. Uh, this was actually the option that HNRC chose. They chose their top six ranked um, organizations. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's for CDBG, there's a total of $32,000 uh, that could be used, and only $10,000 are used in this one. Um, only six organizations are chosen. Good thing is they got their max amount. Bad thing is everybody else didn't get any. So um, once we had new information, I did offer option C. And like I mentioned, the one that was given in option C um, was incorrect. This is the updated one. Um, and I wouldn't recommend this one because of um, on the on the table where it actually doesn't qualify. Um, CDBG would, but um, op you know the, it would be too. It's beyond the the minimums of homeless prevention. Um, not the basic basic needs. I think was within the range. I made a comment of that, but not the um, for option C. Yeah, option C. Yeah, so not recommended because as you see on um, where it says PLHA funds homeless prevention, it has 143. So, um, I mean, if it was chosen, it wouldn't qualify. So, but I did want to give an update uh, to what the numbers actually were. Um, uh, really quick, if you 
So there's these two pots of funding, right? Even within PLHA, there's almost like two. But CDBG, because I know it could be like a little confusing, there were, there's, there was only $32,000 available. Um, and there were new folks that, you know, you had to split it up. And there were considerations we had to make, for instance, um, Bear Area Community Health, uh, due to an application error, didn't qualify, only qualify for one year. So that's why we put them in one year, which meant it was pushing everybody, um, pushing everybody's minimums. If you see adult daycare is number three, we had to give them the max because that was according to what uh, the maximum was for, for the, that awarded amount. So we thought, okay, well, Rise Up wouldn't get, the, um, get it that year, they get it the next year, and then um, it would be a little bit evened out. Uh, Go to the next, I'll go to the next one, then we can have discussion afterwards. Um, so this is option D, this is staff recommendation, um, homeless prevention and basic needs uh, by not including the, the ranked amounts, the maximum ranked amounts, um, then it kind of made a little bit more room under those categories. And the reason I put stars on the ones that were basic needs, um, Oh, I didn't put the stars on the other ones. Well, the ones that are have one star are homeless prevention. The other ones are basic needs is because there was more uh, available. So uh, we could give um, Meals on Wheels the maximum because it was within that amount. But if they were in a different category, which we also had to move, the county was uh, very helpful with that. They, they gave us... Um, some feedback on a few that we had thought were homeless prevention and they're like, oh no, that's basic needs or this basic needs one actually could be over here. So they were really helpful um, with that. Um, and then I think on, yeah, on the bottom too, it also has a, the, the estimated for, for reserves for year one and year two. And it is different because the funding amount is different for, for those two years. Like one year, it's like 236 and next year, it's like, uh, like 360. So, um, yeah, so the, those are ad, in the same for the CDBG funding. We just did a little bit more even for year one and then year two taking in consideration that that block was. Uh, Could I happen. interrupt you just for the math? Because I'm not following. Okay. So with the new one, right? The new one. Okay. If, and let's just go to option D, the new one, the one that, that you are recommending for tonight so mm -hmm. that we have a starting point to go from. If I add up all of the funding in year one, I get like 269,000, what do you get? Um, but but I did it fast the, on the, my diff little... the difference is, is that CDBG is its own pot of funding. Right. So the cells in here only add up for what would be under homeless prevention and basic needs, not CDBG, the total, the total amount is when you do CDBG and PLHA as right, a whole. Right, the 249. Yeah. So all those numbers should be 249, right? The, the sum of the year one funding column should be 249. Yeah, someone else better than I am on this stupid little calculator. I like my 10 key. Oh, okay, yeah. 249. Okay, so on the old, what's in our packet, the actual numbers in year fund in year one funding are not any different. So why isn't it also, why is it 228 there? Let me pull up the, if you guys don't mind, I'll pull up the, the sheet. And option D. I'm just trying to understand what, what how, how these numbers are working. Because I see year one funding, I see year two funding. I understand that it's broken up by PLHA versus CDBG, and then I understand it's further broken down by homeless prevention, mm -hmm. basic needs, you know, or anything else. But how how am I? So Jimmy's the total of year two, also the two forty eight nine ninety eight. When you do it too, it, yeah, it's just it's because it's it's just a few dollars. Like if you see year two, okay. it says ten six six. Okay, so the total funds then two forty nine and two forty eight for each of year one and year two. If, yes. if we were to approve what's in option D on For the revised, CDG, right, yeah. on the revised statement. Yeah. And that leaves, how, how does that, 
that comes out leaving in reserves 15 and 111 because these are the numbers that we just approved in the prior agenda item for year one? Is that how it's connecting? Yeah. Okay. Mayor, I'm getting 269 also. Yeah, that's what I get column. is 269. But Jimmy just did it and said he got 249, so I was going to just believe him. I don't know. The revised one. But I'm on the revised one too. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I will look at myself. So it's 249, it's 616. <laughs> Let's everybody try. Go. I know. No. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to. The point is it's supposed to agree to whatever the number is. So uh, math is math. Whatever it is, we'll, make, we'll get that corrected. I just wanted to know. Okay. No, but, but these. Oh, you're talking about the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This doesn't add to it. Oh, I understand. <sighs> yeah, I understand. I understand that the bottom adds. It's, it's this that's not this adding. Will, will you go down and do the cell what has the 32,000 and just make sure that's pulling what you think it is. Three through six, okay. Then go to the next one. So it has a 95, seven to nine. Okay, and then the oh. one after that, please. Eleven to 14. Okay, well, if there is something wrong, this is what happened before, but this is what I use on my computer. Okay. And, um, well, what I'm getting at is if, if the numbers that are here under year one funding are 269 and not 249, then they're, we're going over, right? Because that's more, that difference is more than the reserves of 15. That's a difference of 20. Yeah, they're 20,000 off on the second column too. You know what? Okay. 20,000 more. Oh, this thing should be okay. Oh, sure. I think this is. Crystal, do we have a time commitment on when this has to be approved by council? Um, well, HUD hasn't, I think we do because of CDBG. Okay. Would you know the date? What I'm getting at is this is obviously a lot to take in, yeah. and we've got some areas we need to clean up. We have a council meeting in just two weeks. Um, I think we should come back, get this cleaned up, and go through this again with council because it's a lot to digest, I understand. I agree. Yeah, one second. Let me just let me just look at it one more time. Total C-17. Oh, okay. Two, basically. Even if we do that, we'll still take public comment if anybody's here wanting to, to comment. But the math just isn't working as I see it. Hold on one second. Option well, C looks okay. Well, I think the mayor, I think the question that our city minister. Okay, I, I, I'm so sorry. Hold on, I did, go ahead, it, go ahead. it was one, so I just moved it. Yeah, so this is, it's 115. It's 115. See, it said 6D7 to D9. There we go. So it just adjusted all of them right now. Yeah. Right, so why doesn't it change the reserve amount? What, something else must have changed. What else changed? Oh. <laughs> Mayor, okay. if, I can, if I can suggest, um, after public comment, I mean, I, I, I agree with our uh, city administrator, it's a lot to take in, and I just wanna make sure these numbers are accurate. If we're not on a time, crunch in regards to approving this, can we bring this back two weeks from now? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. Everybody fine with that? Okay, so let's go to public comment then and see if, who would like to speak on this item. I received four uh, speaker cards and this is a public hearing, so the public hearing starts at 747, Madam Mayor. Sorry, so thank you. Okay, I will open the public hearing at 747. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh -huh. I have uh, four speaker cards, and it's, the first one is Ron Kirkish, followed by Ann Peterson. All right. Good evening again, Mayor, Council, community. In 2012, we had an issue where a friend of mine and a former Gilroy school trustee was getting funded by the South County Collaborative. And 
unfortunately, he was found guilty of grand theft, two degrees. I still love the gentleman. He's got a good heart, but he made a mistake. I'm not going to name his name, even though he doesn't live here anymore, his family. But the South County Collaborative was not taking care of business and watching the store with our taxpayer money. I don't know if they're doing any better today. Today we have an issue. I saw an agency, a local agency called Caras on those graphs, C-A-R-A-S, and they're asking for money, and I believe that money is coming through the South County Collaborative. I understand that there are some potentially significant issues or problems with some of their past performance, their 990s, and that those are still questions. How are they spending our money? They're asking for what, $10,000, $30,000. Where is it going? How is it being used? Is it being uh, double, just like uh, my friend, did, were they double posting thing or double billing? We don't know. I think we need to find out what they are doing with that money. It's not transparent, and I think we need before we do it. And if we go forward with this, I would ask that we, uh, within two weeks, decide whether we should pull that money from this. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, punish other agencies like St. Joseph's. So by not by saying no, we're not going to do it. But I do think we need to take Caras out and check them out. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Ann Peterson, followed by Teresa Johnson. Good evening, Ma Mayor and Council Members. My name is Ann Peterson. I'm the Executive Director of Live Oak Adult Day Services. Um, we're one of the organizations slotted to receive the block grant funds, and I just want to be here tonight to show you our gratitude and to give you a little bit of an update. So Live Oak has been in Gilroy for about 30 years, and you should know that it's very well respected in the, in the whole county for um, providing the best of uh, senior services for frail dependent seniors. So we provide a day program for folks who have dementia, and in doing that, we allow their families to get a break. Uh, we also, um, we can take anybody. Uh, we have a sliding fee schedule, and nobody's turned away because of lack of funds. Uh, it's a huge thing that we offer, I think, and it's really um, impressive that we have it here in Gilroy. It's one of, we have, three other centers, but the one in Gilroy, there's no, no other one close. The next one is up in San Jose. So it's right now we're, um, we opened in June of 2021, and uh, we could only open to half capacity because of um, social distancing, which we successfully did. And we now have seven families on wait list and hoping to be able to open more fully in the next month or so. Um, you know, it's just a place that, uh, it's a place of joy. People come. We're doing music, dance. Uh, today they watched animals on TV. You know, it's just crazy stuff that we do every day, and the people that come love it. And you get people who are never, were never that social, and dementia has sort of restricted their whole life. And when they come to us over weeks of, jo you know, joining us, they end up being the life of the party. So it's a hugely important thing, and I just hope that we can keep it in one of the one of your plans up there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Teresa Johnson, followed by Tim Davis. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this um, evening and for your past support for the Meals on Meals program. My name is Teresa Johnson. I'm Director of Food and Nutrition Services at the Health Trust. 
We've been providing Meals on Wheels in Santa Clara County to seniors and homebound adults for over 26 years. I would like to briefly summarize the changes that um, happened in our Meals on Wheels program uh, since the pandemic began in 20, March 2020. A week before the shutdown, we were serving 2,000 meals a week. Almost all of those were hot home delivered meals on a daily basis. Three weeks after the shelter in place, we were serving 9,000 meals a week. And by June, we were serving 12,000 meals a week. It was crazy. But um, we're currently serving around 7,000 meals per week, and we anticipate serving about 320,000 meals um, this fiscal year. We really expected the demand to de decrease as vaccinations came about and we thought the pandemic would go away. However, this has not really happened. About 90% of the people that came on to our service during the pandemic, they still qualify for our program. They're homebound, they're nutritionally at risk, they're elderly for the most part, and they're very, very low income. So what we've seen is an explosion in the need of our services in our community. Um, we anticipate serving about 40 clients in Gilroy next year, and we're asking um, your approval to fund um, a portion of serving 18 of those clients. We will serve about 3,000 meals, um, and the funds from Gilroy would be less than half of the amount that would need to support those meals. We get the rest of the money through fundraising, grants, donations, and things like that to subsidize it. Um, your contribution is really critical to us because it helps us leverage funds. We can say the city of Gilroy gives us funds and then we can, you know, get other funds to help support the program. Um, in addition to our hot and frozen meal service, we provide wellness checks. So our clients are checked on. If there's something wrong, we can notify their emergency contact. We used over 200 volunteer drivers last year that counted as many as 7,000 volunteer hours. I wanna leave you with this last quote from the daughter of one of our Gilroy clients. <clears throat> the client is 87 years old and has no family close by. I can't tell you enough how much of a difference these meals make. It is so helpful to have these meals for my mother. I'm so grateful for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next speaker. Last speaker is Tim Davis. Thank you all for uh, having me, allowing me to speak. And thank you so much for the past support for the Compassion Center. It really means a lot. And it's really nice to see all of you, not on the roll screen, but here in person. Um, the Compassion Center has been uh, doing, um, serving unhoused folks since 2011. Um, and we have been uh, grateful to have received assistance through the CDBG and HTF funding since 2017 to 2018. We faithfully um, met our contract obligations for all of these years. This past year, we have uh, fulfilled 10 of the 11 goals that we set for this particular year. We've also um, gone through every monitoring visit that we've had every year to do the oversight that this gentleman was suggesting that you should do. Um, and what this funding is that we're asking for is for basic needs for unhoused folks. And that means food, water, hygiene, clothing, laundry, and also wraparound support, which really helps pave a pathway out of homelessness. In fact, last year, um, the last two years, we've averaged about 100 people per year who have gotten out of homelessness into permanent housing. At a cost of between forty-five and sixty-five thousand dollars in public services for each unhoused individual. That's a net savings of ten times what I'm sorry, one hundred times what this what we're asking for funding for this grant. So the return on investment is rather large, and we're a hard grouping working group of five individuals that go out on a daily basis to try to meet people where they are and to also give them a pathway out of homelessness and become productive members of society. So I would like to encourage you to vote for option D as the city had asked. And thanks again for your support. Appreciate it. 
Thank you. Any other speakers? No other speakers, Madam Mayor. Okay, then closing the public hearing at 7.58. And uh, I think we have council consensus to move this to uh, May 15th, the 16th. Uh, may I make a suggestion that we make uh, a point to not officially close the public hearing, but actually continue oh. it till the same, so we Sorry. can take additional comment at the resumed meeting. Okay, so scratch that 758. Oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's still open. <laughs> Okay. Mayor, yes. sorry. Um, I, I know we're, we're moving this over to our next council meeting. Um, I have some comments or some um, something to say. Should I wait until then or can I? Up to you. If you want to say it now, that's okay. fine. If I, if I may, because um, I'm really bothered by uh, uh, what was just said and slandering of one local organization in this community that does great work for uh, the local Hispanic and people of color. Um, I'm not personally affiliated with the organization, but... I know many people who have gone through that organization have done great things for them. I would suggest instead of focusing on one organization, that we focus on all the organizations if that's the will of our community and our council. I mean, again, um, I know and I, I want to thank all these organizations for the work that you do. I truly, truly do. And I've met with many of them. Um, but for me, it's always been about performance based. You know, we have large and small local organizations that you know um we really don't know what they do but we, we have continued to fund them because uh we trust and believe that they're doing good work so i hope the council is not going to focus in on just one organization um because it's a shame that uh, we're talking about just one organization if there's a conflict of interest i i understand that but to to slander an organization for me is uncalled for um and again i would recommend that Individuals go and visit those organizations, know what they do, and understand what they really do to help our community. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking out because I, I was really bothered by that. Um, and I'm also bothered by organizations that we've had funded in the past that um, when we request information, we don't get. And I don't see anyone talking about other organizations than just one here. So um, I'll have more comments to, to, to say when we have this larger discussion, but I just wanted to share that because I think it's unfair that we're focusing on one organization and has um, has done good work in our community. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will let everyone know, since we're, we're here and that, that this item is going to get continued, that I tried, I asked to see all of the financials that were submitted by all the grant applicants. And I learned that the only ones that we get financials for are the ones who haven't applied before just the new ones. So if you're trying to look for that, you're only going to find it for the two organizations on this list that are that are uh, newly applying for these funds. And they are uh, Caras and the Boys and Girls Club of Silicon Valley. So those were the two I looked at because they were the only two I had to look at. So we'll go forward with that at the, uh, at the May 16th meeting. Okay. All right. Moving on then to uh, item... Where are we now? Item 10, unfinished business. Introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy, Military Use Policy 708, pursuant to Assembly Bill 481. And Captain Powell, you are on again. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Is this on? It is green. How's that? Is that better? Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. I'm here to provide an update on Assembly Bill 481. On this slide, I have listed the steps we have thus far completed to comply with Assembly Bill 481. We have drafted a policy regarding the funding, acquisition, and use of military equipment. On March 25th, we posted the draft policy for 708 on the department's website, which was 30 days prior to a public hearing. On April 4th, we brought draft policy 708 to council for discussion and direction. On April 7th, we hosted a public community engagement meeting that fell within 30 days of submitting the publicized draft policy 708. Between, between April 7th and April 28th, we drafted an ordinance adopting draft policy 708 and made council suggested addition, which was the inclusion of purchase dates for the listed equipment. 
Those dates can be found in section 708.4, which is the military equipment inventory. On this slide, I have listed the remaining steps and proposed timeline to comply with Assembly Bill 481. Tonight, I'm here to introduce, and we will conduct the first reading of the ordinance adopting draft policy 708. May 16th, we will uh, do the second reading and the adoption of the ordinance establishing policy 708. And beginning of May 2023, we will produce an annual report to include the use of military equipment, any complaints received, any internal audits, or violations of policy 708, and fiscal impacts. At this time, I, will be, I would like to answer any questions regarding Assembly Bill 481, draft policy 708, or the ordinance. Perfect. Um, Ty, do you, do you read the ordinance? No, uh, they will need to vote on reading the waiving first reading and read by title only first. Okay. Mayor, can I so, move for approval or do uh, we need to see public well, comment? First, public, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, there's nobody on the board, so I'm, I'm assuming no council members have questions. So open public comment. I received no speaker cards, Madam Mayor. Okay, closing public comment. So yeah, now if anybody yeah. wants to. I would like, I'd like to um, move for a motion on, on um, well, yeah, move for approval. I'll second. <laughs> Wait, excuse me. The first motion should be to read the ordinance by title only and waive further reading. That should be its first separate motion. Perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Madam Mayor, who, may I ask who was the second? Uh, second? It, Council Member Hilton. Thank you. And that's a roll call vote, right? Yes. Okay. Council Member Almaderas? Council Member Rocco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Libra Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, and so then the second one is a motion to adopt the ordinance. Okay, well, oh. I think this, the clerk Let's has to read, read the title now, now, yes. now oh. that we've uh, authorized them to do that. You've authorized them to do that. Okay. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy adopting a military equipment use policy pursuant to Assembly Bill 481. Move for approval. Okay. <laughs> Second. <laughs> that's why I kind of hesitated he the first time. Well, I know. Sure. Me, and that's another roll call vote, right? Thank you. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Council Member Armadares? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lira Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tavar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 11, City Administrator's Reports, three. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh -huh. I do have three reports. Uh, the first is the update on Cohansey Avenue and Monterey Road, which was a, a council-initiated request. I have a very lengthy explanation about the history of that intersection, but I will uh, summarize that to kind of tell you what's going on right now. Uh, we do occasionally get calls from residents wondering why the lights aren't working, why the, the, the intersection is not finished, and et cetera. It, the summary is that the plan that was originally approved uh, by Union Pacific Railroad and all the entities involved had to be revised during certain things that have changed. So they are currently in the process of having a Union Pacific Railroad review uh, revised plans, and the plan at this point is to get that intersection completed uh, at beginning at the beginning of the year or into the early next year. Once all that work is configured, then the lights can be turned on, then the railroad crossing will be active, and all those components will come together. It's just an issue right now of redesigning it, getting it approved by the, uh, the railroad, which does take a considerable amount of time. And none of that can... Um, None of those lights or things can function until that's all they've completed. So um, it's really at the it's at the railroad's hands right now. So uh, Daryl's here to answer any questions as well. If you uh, have any other questions on Cohansey and Monterey, okay. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. I have questions too. Okay. Sorry, I'll come yeah, in. It was all approved. Okay. Then why didn't we get it done? I mean, it's been what seven years. So obviously, maybe we didn't need to do it at all. <coughs> If, if we needed it so bad that we made the developer pay for it, why haven't we done it in the last seven years? As a 
City Manager explained, Mr. Brock, though, that the first design was approved and went through the railroad, but come to find out it was unbuildable due to some conflicts that the developer had not looked into as far as the encroachment on neighboring properties. So that had to be scrubbed and redesigned unless they were going to buy that property, which they did not. So they had to start the whole process all over again through the railroad system, which usually takes a few years. Okay. Um, I, I know I saw Councilmember Hilton raise his hand, but then the board says Armadaris next. Are you guys okay with me going Decided by the board? Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Armadaris. Um, I've, I've seen or heard of at least half a dozen car accidents at that intersection um, in the past five years and countless near misses because I dropped my kids at Christopher and then come home and it's it's a constant, especially, you know, during morning uh, commute hours. So I'm wondering, is there any, um, are there any traffic mitigation measures that we can take in the meantime? It's a great question. There actually have been some mitigations improved there with lane striping and some different turning uh, signage out there. One of the issues is that people are not following the signage. They're actually making turns that are legal out there and putting people at risk. And mm -hmm. that's hard to deter without having a police officer park right there. Thank you. Council Member Hilton. Um, so, is, so it's staff's position right now that we're not expanding the scope anymore. Plans are done on staff's side. It's been turned to UP for approval and there is no going back to staff to expand any scope of the project. Like that's, that's, a, that's a commitment. Because what I'm worried about is that as we delay and escalate scope and all that, that this might end up turning into the Cohensi Bridge where the costs all of a sudden exceeded what is reimbursable in the TIF and then we end up having to deal with that. Um, so is that, that, I can leave tonight knowing that that, that is the plan? That is the plan. However, there is some grading issues on our side of the right-of-way, in the city right-of-way, not county, that the developer's engineer is revising while we're waiting for the UPPR approval. But you are. But that's on that's on the developer. That Who's, is correct. It, it, they want to get this done and, and moved on. And they do. As you know, the and we do. It's the same way <laughs> as putting in crosswalks and intersections. Like the, people are going to go where people want to go. You're not going to be able to control that. Um, so. Correct. I can hear the commitment tonight on staff. Yes, sir. No more expanding of the scope. Yes. <laughs> We're done. We want to finish. Okay. All right. Council Member Marks. So do we know what revisions that Union Pacific need to make to that intersection? It, w it was a very wide four lane mm -hmm. going through there into the county, not in the city, right across the road tracks mm -hmm. right heading into the county. Mm -hmm. That four lane ran right through the living room of a house right there that the developer didn't do their due diligence to find out what the impacts were. So you either have to buy that property, take out that house, and incur that cost, or revise your plans. They chose to revise their plans and narrow it back down to two lanes, not four, which changed the whole dynamics of the plans that were previously approved, and they have to start all over through the UPPR. Now, how um, seven years has passed. Mm -hmm. So how um, more expensive is this project right now? Well, the, the actual equipment for the railroad has been sitting in two train cars, if you drive by there, for years to be mm -hmm. installed. It's there. Now, it may need to be modified because we're going from four to two lanes, however, but that would be cheaper than using uh, the, the current equipment. So it's already been purchased and it's there. We pay for it. Because I have to agree with Councilmember Hilton, that's my concern, is that all of a sudden the price is going to be way too expensive and the TIF is going to have to pay more money out and it just so hopefully this is done by the or get started by the beginning of 2023 that's our goal all right thank you okay. that's right <laughs> council member the roman yes yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna take my shot at beating a dead horse but right. you know i think uh, <laughs> council member hilton i think summed it up quite well in that yeah i mean this thing's been going for a long time so we just want to make sure that on our side Everything is done and squared away. That being said, and I, and I think you hear that, you, you get all that. That being said, uh, do we have any estimation as to when we might hear back from Union Pacific to try to move this thing forward? The thoughts are it might be by the end of this year. They've already reviewed it once and the uh, scope narrowed, but we, on our, in our world, the engineering world, we call the, the, uh, in, the railroad folks the gods of the railroad because they have their own time frame and we cannot leverage them at all. So when they get to it, they get to it. So, so mysterious are the ways of the UPRR. Okay. Yeah, absolutely correct.
This is the way. Okay. Hopefully before high speed rail, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Which one comes yeah. first? We'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions here? No. So then, uh, Jimmy, next one. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Another topic that was requested by Council for a report was the Sergeant Quarry, uh, which is a project not in the city of Yorie, but is in the county. And uh, uh, the discussion was a consideration for the Council to take a position. Uh, we're going to ask Council to hold off on that agenda item as the county has not yet released the environmental re impact report. So it would be a bit premature for Council to do, uh, to go through that, but once we have that EIR, we have an opportunity to look at it, to give you some information, and to perhaps make a recommendation. Uh, we'll bring it back uh, before the uh, comment period is up and uh, the EIR is finalized. Okay, any questions there? All right, then next one. Okay, and then lastly, uh, I did receive some uh, concerns from businesses that are downtown concerning um, some of the uh, suspension of enforcement sections of the Gilroy City Code that most of it pertains to uh, parklets and outdoor dining, and those were expect uh, those were set to uh, expire at the end of May. Uh, we will have an agenda item on May 16th uh, requesting that Council extend those uh, to give us a little bit more time to come up with a permanent um, policy or ordinance or, or whatever. Uh, so that way, this won't be an annual thing. It'll be something that um, is more. Uh, more legislatively supported. As you know, for most downtowns you visited, outdoor dining is a way of life now, and most uh, communities are uh, either maintaining it or expanding it and, and, and probably not regressing on that practice that occurred during COVID. So uh, you should have something here on your 16th, uh, at least to continue the current practice. So we won't be going out there telling the businesses to uh, uh, take down their outdoor dining. All right, Council Member Hilton. Um, thank you, Mayor Blankley. So, uh, Jimmy, is, it would it be the plan to, you said, not continue it every year on its own item? Would this be brought back based on our, uh, how we go on the 16th into our zoning code amendments? Like, since that's coming back soon, is that where it would get rolled into? I, I'm going to phone a friend, uh, <laughs> community <laughs> development director, uh, John Biggs, who is, is good at this. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. I don't necessarily think it would be a zoning code amendment. I think we would look at it as its own policy separate from the zoning codes. It would probably be the, the best way to approach it, probably by resolution rather than a resolution adopting a set of policies rather than a code, just because it gives us some flexibility in the future to swiftly react to changes in the market conditions in the downtown. Now, I think cities all over the state have tried to avoid making it zoning. Yes. Because it gets very complicated and difficult when you do that. Thank you. All right, anyone else? <clears throat> All right then, thank you, Jimmy. Okay, city attorney's reports, Andy. All right, yeah, I'd like to give a brief report on a case that came out today. It's the very one that Mr. Kirkish mentioned, and it's a Supreme Court case you may have heard about, about flags, flying flags from city uh, flagpoles. And because we have a policy related to that, it is relevant to what the city does. Uh, this case had been awaited and generally assumed it would come out the way it did. It's called Shirt Left versus City of Boston. Boston had, has a city hall with a big park out in front, and the park is incontrovertibly a public forum. People show up to the park, they can say and do anything. They have three flagpoles. They fly an uh, uh, American flag, a state flag, and a city flag. But the city flag flagpole, they allow people who are holding festivities in the park to request to fly a temporary flag for a few hours on the third flagpole. So for 12 years, Boston had approved every request, hundreds of them, and the only one they turned down was Shirtleft, the plaintiff, because he wanted to fly a religious flag. And there was no written policy, which is really kind of bizarre. And Boston felt somehow, somebody in the staff felt that they would be uh, violating the establishment of religion clause, which is the one that says that a state shall not establish religion as opposed to a state shall not discriminate against religion. And the court said, well, that's not really the issue. You have created a public forum because you've never turned down a request except this one. And if you've created a public forum, then you cannot discriminate against people based on the content of their speech. And particularly, you can't discriminate because someone wants to say something religiously based or fly a flag that has religious connotations. Um, we knew this case was uh, coming along at the Supreme Court when we, when we worked on the Gilroy policy for commemorative flags. 
that you adopted three uh, months ago. We believe our policy is okay because we made efforts not to create a public forum. We do have a written policy. We do not allow certain categories of speech because the city determines by adopting the policy that this, we as the city do not wish to express our opinions on certain subjects, including politics, religion, uh, commercial speech, and including offensive or discriminatory speech. So certain kinds of flags are banned, but that's not a discrimination against any particular group. It's pursuant to a written policy, and every request will come to the council for discretionary action. So we don't think the, this policy affects our ability to enforce the commemorative flag policy. We knew this case was coming out. We expected it to come out the way it did. And although ultimately it was kind of a simple case, but there were a whole bunch of opinions where the justices fight with each other about how to analyze it. If anybody's interested in the minutia of analyzing <laughs> First Amendment things, I commit this case to you. It's interesting to read. But the, the net result was pretty clear. They had created a public forum. We have worried about that with the city's website also. We worried about that with banners on First Street a few years ago. All these issues arise. The social media policy that we adopted carefully avoids establishing a public forum as well. Because once you do establish a public forum, you can't uh, censor it. Anyway, that concludes my report. Unless okay. anyone has any questions. Anybody questions? All right, thank okay. you. Okay. Should I announce the closed session? Please. Now? Next item 13.1 Conference with Real Property Negotiators, pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.8 and Gilroy City Code Section 17A8A2. The property is 145th Street. Negotiators are Jimmy Formas and Kareen Decker. The other party to negotiations is Advantage Peak LLC. Under negotiations, price and terms of lease. Uh, we should take public comment, and then we do not have to vote to go into closed session, but once we go into closed session, we have to vote to remain in closed session, and that is a reportable action. All right. I'd like to open public comment if we have any. I received no speaker cards, Madam Mayor. All right. Then closing public comment. And... Um, how about we come back at, do you guys want to come back at 8.30 or sooner? <laughs> okay, so, yeah, I'm with, I'm with you all. So come back as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah.